All right, well, let's open our Bibles to um, Genesis chapter 27, a 27th chapter of Genesis. We're going to um, endeavor to get through 27 and 28 this morning. Uh, Genesis 27. Now, I, I think the 27th chapter of Genesis sort of uh, illustrates what, what C.S. Lewis said uh, or, or what he meant when he said that a, a little lie is sort of like a little pregnancy. You know, I mean, you can't be a little pregnant, right? I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not, and, and so a lie is a lie. Now, now here in chapter 27, we're going to see that many of these people that we hold up in high esteem, and, and, and this is what's so great about the Old Testament, that it sort of, it pulls back the veil, and it shows us um, that many of what we would term as the heroes of the faith actually came from very dysfunctional families and, and very dysfunctional situations and, and, and very dysfunctional backgrounds, really. And, and, and so it interests me how often we think to ourselves that, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I can't be used to any great degree by the Lord is, is because of the degree of dysfunction that may be in my life or in my past or whatever, and what we discover going verse by verse through the Old Testament is that if coming out of a dysfunctional uh, environment disqualifies one from being used of God, then all of these people, or at least 90% of these people, should never have been able to be used of God. Now, uh, since we've been out a couple of weeks, and we ought to take great encouragement that. Now, since we've been out for a couple of weeks, here's the situation we've got getting back into chapter 27. You've got a, a mom and a dad, uh, by all appearances, a, a very um, wonderful marriage, a very happy marriage. Isaac and Rebecca appear to be deeply in love with one another. Uh, she gives birth to twin boys, and, and although they were twins, there's no doubt they were uh, very different in their temperaments and, and very different in the way that, that they approached life. You had Esau, he was the hunter, he was the athlete, and I think it was because of these qualities that were in him that caused his father to really just gravitate towards him, all right, and, and so he has a, a real affection uh, for Harry, all right, and that's what Esau meant, and, and, and then you've got Jacob, uh, we were told that he was more of a mild man. Now again, he's no pansy, as we'll discover when we get down the road here. Pretty tough guy, but not nearly as tough as Esau. But, but Jacob, Jacob was a thinker, right? I mean, Jacob was good in school. Jacob was a kid that brought home the good report cards. And, and so there were those things in Jacob's life that a mother would appreciate and, and that would cause her to gravitate towards him. So there's favoritism going on within the home. Now, the problem was <clears throat> that God said the younger would rule over the older, that, that Jacob would rule over Esau. And of course, that went contrary to the culture and, and therefore and also contrary to the desires of Isaac, his father. And so because all of this, the scene was then set for, for just some some real problems within this household. And, and, and it was really um, this conflict then uh, that began to unravel this family over the years. Now, where we pick up our story in chapter 27, the, sh the scene shifts forward now to Isaac really being an old man. All right, And what we're going to discover is that this family, who began well, really, you remember the earlier years showed somewhat of a, a healthy spiritual environment within the home. But, but this family who began well has now, because of this conflict, because of this sin of favoritism and that which ensued and, and came forth from it, because of this conflict now, this family that started strong really became a family where the spiritual wheels were, were just falling off the wagon, <clears throat> and we're going to see a family that is just embroiled in lying and scheming and manipulating. So uh, Isaac and Rebecca, this couple here, they give us a picture uh, of a, 
of a, of a man and a woman in a marriage that started strong, but they allowed sin to come into their lives, remain unchecked, it then multiplied, and now they are finishing horribly. All right? They could not say as the Apostle Paul would in the New Testament, hey, hey, I fought the good fight, I finished the race well, I've stayed true, pressing towards Christ uh, to the end. And so if you and I desire to finish well, one of the things that we ought to mark as we're going through this story is, is really the, the growth and the, the cancerous nature um, of sin left unchecked, unrepented of in the heart of uh, the people of God. Now, Again, how did this conflict, how did the whole deal get started? It was the sin of the parents, remember, and not treating their children with equal affection, okay? And there is no indication in the scriptures that Isaac and, and Rebekah ever repented of this favoritism. <clears throat> and of course, this then produced significant dysfunction within the homes, uh, within the home and, and particularly in the lives of these two boys. And yet, the amazing thing is, and, and that which gives me tremendous courage, what ought to encourage you and I is that God still works in our dysfunction. God still works through our dysfunction. And, and in fact, God uses our dysfunction in order to root out of our hearts those things that he would desire us to separate ourselves from, okay? So God works in and through our dysfunction and actually uses it to root out of us those things he would desire us to separate from. And again, the Old Testament calls us, uh, New Testament uh, calls us, Paul does to uh, 2 Corinthians 6, come out and be separate from the things of the world. And we're going to see this theme of separation play out, I think, very powerfully in our text tonight. All right, so let's dig in and get after it. We've got a lot to cover. Now, there is, remember, a 40-year gap between the end of chapter 26 and where we are picking up in chapter, uh, again, here in chapter 27. Let's look at verse 1. Now, it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. And he said to him, here I am. And Isaac said, Behold, now I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. Uh, in, in the Hebrew, pretty strong indicator that this means venison, a deer as such. You're going to see that translated that way in the King James. Verse 4, And prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, some of you might be picking up on this, but before we get to that, I, I, I don't know, I'm dating myself here. I don't know how many of you remember the show Sanford and Son back in the 70s. Raise your hand, all right? Uh, so, so Isaac sort of reminds me of Fred Sanford here. I mean, the guy thinks he's gonna, gonna die at every turn. You know, I'm having the big one, right? And so I, I, Isaac's assuming he's gonna die when the reality is, he reminds me of Fred Sanford, so does Esau in, in that respect. But he's assuming he's going to die here a, a couple of times, and, and, and the man is going to live in reality for another 43 years from this point. So he's got a ways to go here. Now, if you grab a calculator, if you get bored this week, I've given you the verses in your study guide, grab a calculator and a dozen or so verses in Genesis, you'll discover at this point in our text, Isaac is 137. And the twins are about 77 years old, where we're at in the text here. Now, what we've got is he spoke an instruction to the firstborn son here. You remember Esau came out of there before Jacob. Jacob said, hey, man, get back in here. That's why they called him heel catcher. Uh, but Esau, he's, he's spoken instruction to the firstborn son, the eldest son. Uh, we know uh, 40 years have passed around 40, 37 to be exact. And, and so again, we would assume with all this time that's passed, that over the years, Rebecca would have no doubt communicated a number of times what God had revealed to her, that she would have shared this with her husband, that the younger would, would serve the older. And, and, you know, she would uh, approach Isaac. Well, you know, the one that I really like is, is the one God likes, the one God's going to bless and so forth. Now, what is obvious here? and will continue to become obvious, is that Isaac 
over this 40-year gap that, that we've jumped here between chapters has severely swerved into the flesh. In fact, his whole family has, my guess is, in, in part as a, a result of, of very poor leadership. So his sin of favoritism has now, over the years, morphed into just, just a very strong, outright disobedience. Here he is now attempting to subvert the plan of God and pass the blessing unto the son that God has rejected. All right? <clears throat> now, just get with me here. Just simply think about this. Here is the passing of the torch, right? Here is the grand event. I'm, I'm passing the blessing onto the son. No doubt this is supposed to, it should have been a very public thing. You would have thought he'd call out half the village, if not the whole village, and, and celebrate this wonderful deal. This is the, the patriarchal passing of the torch. But what we have here is Isaac is doing it in secret. He's doing it behind closed doors, which tells you and I, the man understands this is wrong, that it's not God's will. Here he is, Esau, shh, shh, hey, just going to be you and me, man. Go get me some deer, man, get me some venison. I'm going to bless you. We're going to get this thing done before anybody knows the score, right? Now, why would he do this? Well, probably the same reason that you and I oftentimes stand in the way of God's will in our lives, right? I mean, there comes a point where, hey, hey, man, I, I want my will done, and, and this is what I want to see happen, and, and th this over here is what will make me happy, okay? So this man, he started very strong, and he could not be finishing any worse than he is here, and it is all a result of unrepentant sin left unchecked in this man's heart. Now, let me point something else out. And listen, men, no doubt as this man's heart was, was heading south, if you will, over the years, so then was his capacity to lead his life well and be the spiritual leader and the head of the home that God would have called him to be. And so what this lack of, so here, um, what this lack of proper headship um, resulted in over the years is, is just a corresponding deterioration in, in the heart of his wife. Okay? So as this man was swerving further, further into sin, uh, you would have to assume so was his headship, and, and therefore it should come as no shocker to us that we see his wife deteriorating significantly as well. Yet, what we're going to discover is, is still, uh, God, of course, is God, and he is going to, uh, his will is going to come to pass despite the idiocy uh, in this couple, in this family. Now, now the right way for Rebecca, uh, Rebecca to have responded to this would have been to just trust God, and to just pray for this man, right? And just let God deal with the man. But instead of doing that, let's notice what she does then in verse 5. So Rebecca was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So she's eavesdropping, all right? I mean, that, not, in this family, nothing's out in the open. We're going to see no communications going on. There's just secrets and veils and, and hiding behind walls. So here's Rebecca on the other side, you know, with the ear to the wall. We're going to see this continue. It's going to get crazy. Now, uh, Rebecca was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game uh, to bring home, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare, uh, prepare a savory dish for me that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there that I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father such as he loves. Then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat so that he may bless you before his death. So the whole scene is of course hatched and plotted now by Rebecca. And of course, what does she think she's doing? She thinks she's helping God out. And so in that, she seems to be a lot like her mother-in-law, Sarah, right? We don't have to go back to that. They weren't trusting in the promises of God. Hey, uh, Abe, why don't you just take on Hagar over here? And, and Ishmael was brought forth, and, and we know that story, Sarah's idea. So we're able to see that Isaac marries a gal, just like dear old mom, 
all right? And, and so she's a schemer as well, and she's going to help God out. Now again, why, why do we fall into, uh, as believers, why, as those to whom God has been revealed, why do we fall into these uh, situations where we're going to make it work for God, and, and we're going to be the ones that are going to bring about God's will through the efforts and the energies of the flesh, right? Why, why do we do that? I, and I think because a lot of times what we're thinking is, well, the end justifies the means, right? I mean, after all, does God not want Jacob to have the blessing? Of course he wants Jacob to have the blessing. So therefore, we need to pull out all of the stops in order that God's will might be done rather than saying, God, this is what you've promised. This is what you've said, and you're going to take care of it. Okay? Now, you'll notice then in verse 11 that Jacob says, and get this, Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, he saw my brother is a hairy man, and, and I am a smooth man, and perhaps my father will feel me, and then I will be as a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. Now again, I, I think this reveals a, a little bit about Jacob's character. I notice that he's, he is saying your plan is flawed, but notice he's not saying your plan is flawed because of moral reasons. But your, your plan is flawed because of logistics, all right? This isn't going to work, Mom. I mean, he's a hairy dude. I don't have a hair on my body. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that in the process of Dad blessing me, he's probably going to put his hands on me, and, and he's gonna fit, the jig's going to be up, right? Now, you'll notice in verse 13, well, Rebecca's got a contingency plan, man. She's got it all figured out. Notice verse 13. So his mother said to him, well, your curse be on me, my son. Now, interestingly, she's going to pin it on him later. We'll get to that. Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Pay attention to verse 15. This is huge. Because we're going to get back to it later. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. Jacob is being clothed in the garments of the firstborn. Some of you might pick up on that. Tuck that away. Here Jacob is being clothed in the garments of the firstborn to get the blessing, you see. We'll get back to that. Verse 16. And she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. Now you talk about, the, so she's crazy gluing goat skin on the dude. All right, now talk about a hairy guy. I mean, Esau is about as hairy as, I mean, this is one of those guys, he takes his t-shirt off at the beach and, and there's a sweater there. All right, I mean, this is a hairy man. And so you can obviously see why, why Jacob was going, mom, mom, this deal is not going to work. And she says, you know, just shut up and do what I'm telling you. And, and, and you know, this is going to happen. And, and so she starts gluing goat hair on the guy. This lady is determined. So listen, guys, Rebecca is not praying, as we said. That would have been the good thing for her to do. She's not praying. She's plotting, all right? And so here, on to the ruse now. Here comes the scam. Is it going to work? Notice verse 17. She also gave the savory food and the bread which she made to her son Jacob. Then he came to his father, my father, and he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, and notice that Jacob's kind of a, in a bit of a hurry here. Uh, Jacob said to us, he's probably a little nervous. Is this going to go down? I am Esau, your firstborn. Link that with verse 15. He's coming in the name of the firstborn. Are you catching this? So anyway, he says, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now here, here, come on, hurry up, dad. Please sit, sit, get up, eat of my game that you may bless me. And Isaac said to his son, well, how is it that you, you have it so quickly, my son? Remember, he sent Esau out to hunt. 
how did you get back here so quick? And he said, pulling his, his you know, John Lovett's routine, yeah, the Lord did it, that's the ticket, yep, the Lord did it. Well, because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me, yeah, you know, that, that's the ticket. Uh, so he has no problem pulling in God as an accomplice, we'll get to that. Uh, then Isaac said to Jacob, please come close that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not, underline that word, feel. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, well, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. I am sure Jacob is just sweating bullets, wondering if that goat skin is going to come off. Uh, verse 23, he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. <clears throat> so he blessed him Well, it worked. <coughs> and he said, are you really my son Esau? And the lies on top of the lies and, and oh, the tangled web that sin weaves, right? You've know, got one lie, then you just got to lie to mask that and lie to mask that. So we've got the lies really beginning to multiply here. Are you really my son Esau? Verse 24, and he said, I am. So he said, bring it to me and I will eat of my son's game that I may bless you. And he brought it to him and he ate. He also brought, with, uh, brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, please come close and kiss me, my son. And I think of the betrayal of Judas in the garden of Gethsemane when I read this verse. Uh, so he came close and kissed him. And when he, smelled, uh, when he smelled the smell of his garments, so there's the aroma there. Uh, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord had blessed. And evidently Esau smelled a little bit than Jacob did. Jacob smelled like calculators and pencils and paper. Esau smelled like the fourth quarter in the locker room, right? So he's, he's smelling that this is Esau. Now verse 28, Now may God give you uh, of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. All right, well, well, the ruse works. He secures the blessing. But boy, for a while there, it's a bit touch and go, right? Now, evidently, Reba's pretty good in the kitchen because she can make goat taste like venison. But, you know, you get the sense as you begin to read this account that, that as Jacob walks in there, he just senses the stupidity in all of this, right? He, you saw in verse 19, he's kind of rushing. Come on, Dad, you know, hurry up, bless me. Let's get this moving. Well, how'd you get back here so quick? Oh, well, you know, that was the Lord, the Lord, you know, and uh, this, this point is not a small point. It is not without significance. And so we are going to pause upon it for a moment. Notice, guys, that Jacob's got no problem pulling God into this deal. He has no problem naming God as one of his accomplices here. All right? And, and, and it is this bringing in of the name of God so casually and so quickly and so cavalierly that it lets you know where the guy's at. And I think we need to be so very careful in the body of Christ today on this point. It has been my experience that so often um, younger Christians in the faith, not talking about physical age at all, by younger Christians, I mean those who don't have a real handle on the word of God. Uh, it's been my experience that so often younger Christians, they will launch out in a certain direction in their lives and, and they're just so quick and so cavalier to attach God's endorsement upon the deal, all right? Well, you know, this is where God is leading me. And then a mature believer will come along and, and of course, in your mind, you're, you're an attack from the enemy, but a mature believer will come along and say, hey man, wait a minute, I'm not so sure about this. Can we talk about this prayerfully with our Bibles open? I just have some concerns I want to talk through with you. And, uh, but they're in a hurry and they're convinced this is God somehow and, and they haven't yet really made the connection that it's what they want and, and, and not necessarily what the Lord does. So more oftentimes than not, there's a hard lesson in front of those believers. Now, uh, some of you uh, may, have, uh, may have heard or in fact read or know uh, Frederick Buchner, a very prolific man of God. I think he's written over 40 books. He was visiting the campus of Wheat Wheaton College on one occasion, uh, preparing to speak there, and he took note of how how <laughs> casually the students spoke of and how cavalierly um, and, and with such 
in, in his view, alarming frequency. Well, God told me this, and God told me that, and, and God told me the other. And Buchner said, if anybody did that in his part of the world, quote, people's eyeballs would roll back in their heads, their ceilings would fall in, and their houses would catch fire. So I think there's been a real degree of, of irreverence that's crept in, and, and I see a lot of that coming from um, Pentecostal and charismatic circles. I, I, I think we would do very well to be careful how we invoke the name above all names, all right? And the, I, we, we've got to be careful how we deal with the Lord, the name of the Lord in our conversations with one another, that, that we would do so with a real reverence and a real discernment of, of how our mishandling that could lead another brother or sister to stumble. Now, I know we mean well. Maybe we've been taught wrong. The Lord knows that as well but if we get so cavalier with God told me this and God told me that business then younger believers will be hurt because they will be wondering why doesn't God talk to me like that what's wrong with me what's wrong with my faith okay and so be careful that you don't hurt people and, and unbelievers are just going to think you're whack all right so there's a way to communicate uh, how God is working in your life with a degree of, of reverence and and wisdom hey this is what God has has showed me in in his word and 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 this is what I'm hearing in prayer and and these are the doors God is opening and, and this is where I feel like God is leading me and and, and I'm in and and counsel with with a multitude of wisdom and some other believers I mean that is better than God told me all right you get it Okay, let's make sure we, we hang on to that. So, Jacob here pulls God in on the deal when he had absolutely no right mind to do so and makes God an accomplice in something God would have no part in. And we need to guard against doing the same, particularly in this biblically illiterate culture in which we discover ourselves. All right, now, um, Isaac, again, he's questioning this whole deal. He eventually gives into the ruse uh, because he's not walking by faith. But he's walking by sight. Now you say, well, John, he's blind. How could he walk by sight? Now, when you lose one of your senses, you know, the rest of the senses begin to sort of uh, take up the slack, if you will. So Isaac may not be walking by sight in the technical sense, but notice he's walking in the spirit of that. He's relying upon touch and smell and sound. He's operating in the carnal uh, rather than operating in uh, the spiritual. The application is clear that, that when we are not walking by faith, we are running the risk of really having the wool pulled over our eyes. Uh, in this case, I, I suppose the goat hair, all right? Now, um, important detail, uh, again, that I want you to tuck away, <clears throat> and I want you to grab, because it's a, a very poetic, and a part of a very powerful and poetic picture that we'll close with. Notice I had you uh, mark back up there in verse 15, and here in verse 27, Rebecca has Jacob put on Esau's garments. He puts on Esau's clothes, and here Isaac smells the garments in verse 27. Here's what I want you to grab to take note of. We'll return to it. Jacob secures the blessing of his father by putting on the clothes of the firstborn. All right? He is clothed in the garments of the firstborn son in order to secure the blessing. Some of you are starting to, to make the connection. Tuck that away. All right? Now, again, Isaac here, he's a bit skeptical. You've got the voice of Jacob. I mean, did you guys struggle with this if you've read ahead as well? Like, how could he go for this? You know, it, it, you know it, you've got the voice of Jacob, he said, but you feel like Esau and you smell like Esau. Maybe I'm just getting older. You've got the voice of Jacob, but, but you sure feel like Esau. Now, I want you to notice something. He doesn't go by the word he heard, but by how he feels. Are you following me? Jacob does not go by the word that he heard, but by how he feels. And so oftentimes you and I need to be careful to go by the word of God and not the seat of our emotions. Okay, I'll leave you to chew on that in the quietness of your hearts this week. There's a lot here to continue to study and, and pray uh, as you 
uh, move forward with the Lord this week. But, but as we move forward, I, you know, I really think Isaac's uh, going to begin to put two and two together here, and, and he's going to realize that God's will is going to come to pass regardless of his will. Now, uh, notice verse 30. No sooner does the blessing go down that Esau now comes in from the field just as old Jake is skating away with the blessing. Verse 30. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, uh, that Esau, his brother, came in from um, his hunting. <clears throat> then he also made savory food, brought it to his father, and he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's gang, that you may bless me. And Isaac starts flipping out. Isaac, his father, said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your, mark it again, firstborn Esau. All right, then Isaac trembled violently or exceedingly in your translation and said who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate all of it before you came and blessed him yes and and he shall by the way be blessed verse 34 when he saw heard the words of his father he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father bless me even me also O my father and he said your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Now, uh, notice we're told in verse 33, look, Isaac trembled violently. No doubt at this point, it's beginning to settle in Isaac's mind that God's will went forward. And, and so he acknowledges here, I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. I think this was a real wake-up call for Isaac here. I think he is being violently shaken out of his own deception. Uh, the text seems to indicate that here. We'll continue to indicate that th this is the case. He's going to come around. He's going to begin to get on board with where the Lord was going the whole time. All right. So Isaac, if, if, if I may paraphrase, is, is essentially saying, hey man, uh, you know, the way this is working out, maybe mom was right. You know, it really does appear that Jacob is the one that God wants to be blessed. And so he blows a gasket here. Notice he saw his reaction further. Verse 36, then he said, and this is classic, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. That's not what I remember from Genesis 26, but okay. Uh, he took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied, to Esau, behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even, uh, even me also, O oh my father. So Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And he's going to comfort himself by he's going to comfort himself by resolving to kill Esau. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, verse thirty nine. Then es Isaac his father answered and said to him, "Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above by your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. From Esau are going to come the Edomites. There will be a period in Old Testament history where they will shake Israel off for a little." bit. There's a, pr a prophetic element uh, brought forth here concerning that. Finally, verse 41 uh, in this uh, passage. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. You know, Esau... His reaction here so typifies our default nature. Here we are making decisions for ourselves. I, I decide I'm going to launch out in this direction. I launch out in that direction. Things don't go well for me. They don't go as I intended. And rather than saying, look, I'm an idiot. I blew this. I was short-sighted. I'm a fool. Uh, I begin to point the finger of blame to other people. And I begin to blame others for the grief that I've brought about in my own life. All right? Now notice what he says there, verse 36. And it's true he did rip him off of the blessing, but he didn't rip him off of the birthright, did he? I mean, notice he says there, he took away my birthright. Now, if memory serves me correctly, it, actually it was Genesis 25, but if memory serves me correctly, you gave your birthright away for a bowl of chili. All right? 
And so that is just our fallen nature. So often people don't want to look at themselves. They don't want to own their own responsibility because it's easier to simply blame others and and shift our garbage and our responsibility upon others. So the guy, clearly angry here, thinks he's going to find comfort in killing his brother. But you know what? Again, everybody thinks he's going to die, all right? He's not going to die for another 43 years. We will discover down the road, Genesis 33, decades will pass. These boys are going to cool off. They're going to literally and figuratively kiss and make up. But for the moment, he's pretty torqued off. So here comes mom with yet another contingency plan. Man, she's got it all figured out. <coughs> Let's go to verse 42 quickly. Now, when the words of her elder son were... Uh, reported to Rebecca, she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise and flee to Haran to my brother Laban. He's a real character. We'll get to that. Stay with him for a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Now watch this. She pins it on him. This is whole, the whole deal was her idea. Until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you did to him. All right? So she, now she's pinning it on him. Uh, then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of both of you in one day? Now Rebecca's got to set up another scheme, so she does it here in verse 46. How am I going to keep my boy from getting killed? Here comes another ruse. I'm tired of living because of these daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these from the daughters of the land, like Esau did, you remember, all right? What good will my life be to me? I might as well just end it all, right? Okay, so um, you you remember Esau had taken some gals from uh, within the pagan land. They were a real thorn in the side of Rebekah and and Isaac. You you remember that at the end of 26. So so these two daughters-in-law of of Esau's that were taken from the pagan land, driving mom and dad crazy. And so now, here she is. She's figured out a way to get Jacob blessed. Now, she has to figure out a way to not get him killed. And so she sets this whole deal up by telling Isaac, you know, these two daughters-in-law, they've been driving us crazy. And boy, you know, if my little Jacob takes up with one of these types, I mean, boy, you know, it's just going to, you know, I, there's, I, I can't go on living. And I, so I, I say, let's send them back to the old country to get one of them good gals uh, from back there. And of course, Isaac, you know, he falls for it, big, dumb, and happy and all. And okay, that sounds like a great idea. And, and so, so just like his dad, he's one of those guys that, thinks he's in charge of the home, but nothing could be further from the truth, right? All right, now, uh, here's the tragedy. The tragedy is that throughout this whole ordeal, they are under the impression that Jacob is only, is only going to be gone for a few days, all right? The reality is they will never see Jacob again, ever. He is gone. He has left the building and will not return. Now, this is the tragedy of us trying to manipulate, and it's the tragedy of us trying to take control of our own destinies rather than submitting to the will of God and the power of God to work in our life that here we are, we're trying to find happiness. Where am I? Well, well, where do I want to go? Well, where I'm going to be happy. We don't seek out God's will. And we're trying to wire the deal together so we think we can have everything in life that we want to have. And I have a sense that God wants to move me somewhere in my life. But, you know, I think I'm going to be the one to dictate that. Thank you very little, God. And I'm the one that's going to make it happen rather than just resting and trusting in God bringing about his will. Listen, the tragedy of manipulation, both the manipulation of others and more importantly, the manipulation of ourselves. And the lesson here, the tragedy of manipulation, is that she wound up losing the very thing she was trying to protect. She'll never see her beloved son again, and all as a result of her her manipulation and her focus upon herself and what she wanted. You with me? All right. That's why we meditate, you know, those of you, if you know, you sense that, that God's beginning to really turn the corner and do a real work in your life, that's why we meditate on Psalm 46.10, be still 
and know that I am God. And if you look that up in the Hebrew, you'll discover that means cease striving. Stop sweating. Cease striving. Be still and know that I am God. All right, so Isaac, he, he takes Rebekah's bait, but he no doubt begins to get on board with the Lord's program. Look at verse 1 of chapter 28. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. All right, mom's ruse works. Arise, go to Pat and Maram, the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Take yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may possess the land of your sojournings which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padam Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padam Aram to take to himself a wife from there and that when he blessed him, he charged him saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to, of all people, where does he go? Ishmael and married uh, besides the wives that he had, uh, Mahalath and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Neboeth. All right. So what we have here is really the sending away now of Jacob. And, and, and what we have here is, is really a restatement of the blessing. This is kind of a do-over for Isaac. Now that, that he's understanding, hey man, God's will is going to come to pass, whether I like it or not. He's getting kind of a chance. It's a little bit of a do-over. Only in this restatement of the blessing, we see more of a focus on the spiritual aspect of the blessing and the covenant flowing through him. Whereas in, in the previous chapter, we saw more of the material aspects of that being brought forth. So we're able to see Isaac's now moving out of the flesh into the spirit again, kind of a do over here. He's on board with what God uh, knows. Uh, he, he knows now what God has going on. Now, in Esau here, he could see in this, again, this is just a family where everybody's trying to out-manipulate the other. Here's Esau, sees his dad, bless his brother, recognizes his dad, doesn't want to see his brother with any of the gals here in the land, and so he goes and he finds another wife. Obviously, they weren't happy when he found wife, wives from in the pagan land. So, okay, I'm going to somehow weasel my way back into the graces of God. And, and what does he do? But he goes to the stock that God had already rejected in Ishmael. Are you with me? So, Esau, he's, when we are walking in the flesh, when we are thinking of self, we're just going to do dumb things. At this point, I feel sorry for the guy. There is such a lack of discernment uh, going on in his life. I wish we had time to blow that up a little further. Now, picking it up again in verse 10, this is now where we begin to shift gears. Jacob is now on his way. He's going to take center stage. The patriarchal blessing has been passed. And, and what we have here, uh, not, not many verses left, but they are fantastic, fantastic text. Verse 10 is a summary statement. It's going to tell us where Jacob's, go, or where Jacob's going. And then verses 11 to 20 or 2 are going to tell us what happened along the way. So verse 10, Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. There it is. Now here's what happened along the way. Verse 11, he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you. Uh, to you and to your descendants. Verse 14, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. This sounds a lot like what Christ said to the disciples in Matthew 28, right? Uh, and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Now, uh, again, it, Esau, we remember the last time we were together, a picture of the unbeliever, picture of the natural man. Jacob is now taking on, really taking on the picture of the New Testament believer here. Now, this is crazy, awesome text. Uh, uh, let me begin to unpack it 
this way. Now, um, I find it very interesting that there is no indication that uh, up to this point that Jacob has had any real spiritual hunger. Excuse me. I mean, up to this point, everything that we have seen of this guy, it doesn't indicate that there's a, a desire on his part for God, that it doesn't seem to be a, a longing after God. I mean, here he is in reality running away from a brother he had ripped off in order that he doesn't lose his life. All right? And now out of nowhere, I mean, this guy has no spiritual hunger, running from ripping off his family, and, and now out of nowhere, God appears unto this man. And again, just like you and I, so many of us, we were just living our lives. And, and we didn't wake up one morning and just have a particular interest in, in the things of God, right? I mean, but just slowly the Lord began to draw us to himself. He began to put people in our path. We began to, to see things around us, whether on TV or, or science or, or books or whatever, you know, Things just began to jump out at us in kind of a, a unique attention getting way. And, and looking back now, we're just able to discern how that the Holy Spirit was, was just drawing us unto the Lord. And the Lord began revealing himself to us much in the same way now that he is doing here with Jacob. Now here, he sovereignly, God comes and sovereignly, cho sovereignly chooses this weasel. And God has sovereignly chosen many weasels since then, including the one speaking to you, all right? And, and, and so he just appears, and, and, and it's just in his sovereignty and in his grace that, that he appears unto this man who had no desire for him. Now, you'll notice then in verse 16, here God comes to... Now, we get so caught up in what our part is and we elevate our efforts and, you know, it's, it's what I'm doing and, and God came to me because I was doing... Oh, watch what the guy's doing when... Where, where was the guy when God came to him? Let's get to verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. He wasn't doing anything. He was sleeping. Receive that. It's not a small point. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head. By the way, this was not a pillow, okay? Uh, what he was doing was placing a stone uh, to, at his head for protection. There was a lack of trust in God, okay? He wasn't sleeping on a stone. All right, as some have, have um, incorrectly exposited. Uh, but this was for protection. Interesting how that stone of protection is now a, a pillar of worship unto God. A stone of self-protection is now part of a, a pillar of worship. So great contrast there. That's for free. All right. So Jacob rose early in the morning, took that stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on his top. Now, verse 19, huge. Stay with me. Almost done, all right? Verse 19, he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, we saw Abraham coming to Bethel earlier, but that was Moses just telling us, okay, this is what this place will be called. Jacob names it, all right? So he says, he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously, underline Bethel, all right? And then uh, previously, the name of the city had been Luz, underline Luz. Gotta get this. It has rocked my world in a personal way this weekend, all right? So he is, he is just awestruck, Jacob is, by this, this whole experience. Now, you remember that Jesus, in John chapter 1, claimed that he was this ladder, all right? John 151. This dream was about Jesus, Okay? You remember that Christ said, you're going to see upon the Son of, of God, angels ascending and descending upon me. Christ was taking them back to this Old Testament imagery to point out the fact that he is the one who is the connection, the bridge, the link, the ladder between earth and heaven. All right, And of course, 
we know that Christ is going to come through the line of Jacob, that the covenant is going to flow through Jacob. And so Jacob has this dream, and he's blown away by it. Now, this is huge. Again, verse 19, man, stay with this tune in. You'll notice that Jacob, he changes the name of this place. Now, Bethel means, if you remember from our earlier study, the house of God. Luz, and I think this is very instructive here, Luz means separation in the Hebrew. Listen strong. Here he comes to the place of separation, and what does he discover? He discovered that he's, he's in the presence of God. Upon coming to a place of separation, he discovers he is now in the house of God. Some of you really need to hear this. I needed to hear this yesterday. Oftentimes in our lives as God is dealing with us, Maybe there are situations or things or relationships that that God is calling us to separate ourselves from. You know, the word of God calls us to come out and be separate from the things of the world. And yet there is so often an unwillingness uh, on our part to want to be separated from these things. But yet... You will discover that if, if, we will, if we will just take that step of obedience, separating ourselves from those things that God wants us to be separated from, we make that wonderful discovery that God, that there's just a new dimension to our relationship with him, that he is more real to us than he's ever been before. And, and we make this unspeakably amazing discovery that we're right there in the very presence of God. He comes to the place of separation and discovers the presence of God. And friends, I just want to encourage you in the quietness of your hearts this week, challenge yourselves. What is it that God may be calling you to separate yourself from? Bring forth that obedience and you will have punched through a wall. You will have discovered a new dimension, a new dynamic to your relationship with God that you've been deceived from by not separating yourself from that thing or those things. Okay? And so I pray that you will go before the Lord in the quietness of your hearts this week and inquire. Finally, Let's wrap it up tonight in verse 20. And of course, this is so true to form of Jacob. This is going to be the deal that God is going to try to root out of his heart. And by the way, if this, what, what follows here, begins to resonate with your heart, that's what God wants to root out of you and I as well. Let's close. Verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, now, now notice the repetition of I and me here, all right? Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety. How how many were there? Uh, And then the Lord will, well, then the Lord will be my God. Well, what a deal for you, God. All right. Verse 22, this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, uh, um, will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, now how's that for a deal, God? You know, you take care of me and you give me stuff and I'll, I'll let you be my God. Right? Now, here we have God sovereignly coming to Jacob and saying, Jacob, this is what I'm going to do. Now, you notice how God-centered God's promises were. You go back up to verse 13, 14, 15. I am the Lord. I will give it to you. I am with you. I will not leave you. I have promised you. And, and of course, the language that Jacob is using, you know, if you'll be with me, if you'll keep me, if you give me. And so we're just able to see that Jacob is... Rather than responding to the Lord, what Jacob should have said was, you know what, God, you're so good, and, and I can't believe you're going to do all of this for me. I mean, I mean, just all that I have is yours, and, and, and I just commit all that I am to you. But instead of that, Jacob approaches God on the basis of, you do this, I'll do that. You do that, I'll do this over here. 
And so God is going to root out of this man. God is going to put him in a situation that he cannot, the schemer, the bargainer, he's going to put him in a situation that he cannot bargain himself out of. And oftentimes in our lives, friends, it seems that God just paints us in some corner that we can't get out of. And, and, and you know, once we, we come to the end of ourselves and we cry out unto the Lord, it is only then that we begin to learn what it is to relate to God upon the basis of grace and not self. And so Jacob will have this rooted out of him. And so it's important that we learn as we go through this text those lessons that God is trying to teach Jacob, a very powerful picture of the New Testament believer. Clearly, in in, in the most, and we'll close with this, in, in, in the most general sense, I mean, he is sovereignly chosen. He is sovereignly chosen of God. He is utterly undeserving. There is nothing in this man's life up to this point that that has any honor to it whatsoever. And yet God comes and sovereignly chooses this man and reveals himself uh, to this man. Even as Paul said, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to us, you know what, what, well, we were still sinners. Christ died for us in demonstrating God's love. But the beautiful poetic picture that I want you to meditate on this week is is this. And it is incredible. I am still floored by it in awe of it. All right? Now, in order to get a hold of this picture, I need to remind you of two things from the word of God. All right? I need to remind you of two things in order that you might... um, understand what is being done here by the Holy Spirit. Let me remind you, all right, that the Bible tells us several times, I've listed a number of verses for you. Uh, You can get into that this week. I know we're running late. We're out in in three minutes, okay? So tune in here. Chase down the verses I've given them to you in your study guide. The Bible tells us that we are clothed in his righteousness, right? We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And, And secondly, what I want to remind you of is that the Bible calls Christ what? Literally, word for word, quote, unquote, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1.15. So two things by way of reminder, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and Christ is called in the word of God, the firstborn of all creation, all right? Now, how was Jacob, uh, how was Jacob accepted? How was he blessed by the Father, by finding shelter in the name of the firstborn. Here comes Jacob, seeking the acceptance of his father, taking the name, I am Esau, your firstborn. Take, here comes Jacob, seeking the acceptance of his father, get the picture, seeking the acceptance and the blessing of his father, taking the name and wearing the clothes and the smell of the firstborn. He was accepted by the father. Why? Because he was clothed in the garments of the firstborn and he had the aroma of the firstborn upon him. He was accepted because he took the name and the clothes and the aroma of the firstborn even as you and I are accepted by our Heavenly Father coming in the name of being clothed by the righteousness of Christ, the firstborn of all creation. All right? And remember Ephesians 5, 2. We weren't there too long ago that Christ was, Ephesians 5, 2, sacrificed for us as an offering to the Lord which was a sweet, sweet smelling aroma unto the Lord. So here Jacob is blessed, secures the blessing and acceptance of the father by coming in the name of the firstborn, in the garments of the firstborn, with the aroma of the firstborn. Even as you and I come in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we are clothed by his righteousness and our prayers are a sweet smelling savor unto him. Okay? Don't miss the picture. This is an incredible picture of the gospel that we find woven yet again into the fabric of yet another story. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, quoting the psalmist, Jesus said, the entire volume of the book testifies of, is written of me. 
the most important thing I could ever pass on to you in terms of studying your Bible throughout the week, you want to get the right interpretation, you put Christ in the a smack dab in the center of every page and you take your focus and your discernment from there. To the degree that you don't do that, you'll swerve into false teaching. Put Christ in the center. It is all about him. Again, I pray that this is causing you to come to an appreciation of the awe and the unspeakable depth of the divinity of the word of God. There is no way this book could ever be written by man. Do you understand that? Even if we were to somehow uh, invent some crazy, uh, technologically advanced, like super, super-powered literary algorithm, and it could never hope to come up with the matchless symmetry and poetic perfection and unspeakable interconnectedness that we find here in the Word of God, it is absolutely stunning. And there's more. Man, keep coming. All right, the word of God, I believe, once again, has, has brought to you and I a number of wonderful insights. Won't go through all of those uh, again. Just a couple of the, the big ones. Don't ever feel disqualified because of dysfunctionality in your pastor presence. Uh, have, going forward, a, a, a real cognizance, a, a, a respect, a reverence for, for how you speak the name above all other names. Don't do that cavalierly and silly and don't do it in a way that will hurt younger believers. All right, And then we are to seek to not manipulate, man. Don't manipulate others. And man, don't manipulate yourself into doing what you think you want to do unless you've really prayerfully gone before the Lord. All right, Now, at the end of the day, lots of lessons. At the end of the day, uh, the melody line in Jacob's life is this, that this is a man who God is going to teach to relate to him on the basis of grace. All right? even as you and I now need to continue to relate to God, not on the basis of our works and what we do, but what he's already done, all right? We gotta do that every week. We are not coming to God on the basis of, well, this is my vow and this is my commitment and, and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and, and wow, what a good deal for you, God. but we are to come to the Lord and relate to the Lord on the basis of what he has done. We are your blood-bought blood children. We are coming in the name of the firstborn. We are clothed in his raiment, in his righteousness. We are coming in the sweet savor of his sacrifice, not the aroma of our own efforts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you that you are holy and yet your love for us is, is just unfathomable what you've done I just pray you would penetrate our thick skulls and our, our stony hearts and, and just soften us to all that you have done and all that you are and all in, in, in the name of just a, a benevolent agape love we will never fully understand on the side of the resurrection Draw us to you, God. Draw us to be in awe of you, God. Show us what it is you would have us to separate from this week that we might experience more of your fullness and more of your presence. God, bring us along. Thank you for your patience and your gentleness. May we be the men and women you have created us to be, both now and forevermore. We ask these things in the matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. All right.